welcome to the Green Pastures Tabernacle uh, Church online. And um, I'm privileged to bring to you the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is so powerful. I have to keep saying this, that Jesus responded to the devil's temptation by telling him that man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I remember there's a scripture that says that the entrance of the Word of God makes the simple brings light and makes the simple wise. The entrance of the word of God brings light and makes the simple wise. And so we are receiving the word of God and it's going to enlighten us and change us. There's a lot of deliverance that comes when we receive the truth of the word of God. Jesus said that uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So there is a deliverance that occurs, sometimes sadly without even your knowledge, as you continue to receive the word of God. And so today I pray that you're going to experience such a liberation as you receive from the throne of God. Last time we were looking at understanding deception and we dealt with part one of our series on deception. And as my characteristic for the sake of catching up and just ensuring that we are together and on the same page, we looked at a number of things, of course, regarding understanding deception. And one of the things we looked at was the levels of deception. And we saw that there are actually three levels of deception, that there is a victim level, there is a deceiver level, and there's a victim come deceiver level. And of course, we went through each one of them, that the victim is a person that is actually uh, subject to deception, and they are the ones that bear the consequences of being deceived, and the deceiver is the one that comes with the deception. That is the carrier of the deception. And then we saw that victim come deceiver is a situation whereby we are both the recipients of deception, but also we are aiding it. We are not stopping the deceiver. We are actually helping them to continue deceiving. So we become both victims and also deceivers. And then we saw that the causes of deception we saw four of them, and the first one we said is ignorance of Scripture. When you do not know Scripture, you will be captured by deception. And then number two, when we are indifferent to the consequences of our actions. Indifference to the consequences of our action is a cause of deception. Many people get deceived because they never see to think about the consequences of deception. And number three, causes of deception an unhealthy fascination with the prophetic and the spectacular. This is a key one. Very many people have an unhealthy, and I want you to mark the word, unhealthy fascination with the prophetic and the spectacular. There is nothing wrong with the prophetic, neither is there anything wrong with the spectacular. But when it becomes unhealthy, all-consuming, and completely uh, you know, suppressing in terms of desire and interest, then you are opening yourself for deception. And number four, we found that another cause of deception is religious hypocrisy. And so in conclusion, we said that we need to be careful because number one, anybody can be deceived. Anybody can be deceived and therefore stay alert. It doesn't matter who you are. You may be educated, you may be poor, you may be rich, you may be great, you may be small, but everybody is a candidate of deception if you are not alert. So please stay alert, and especially during this time when there are so many conspiracy theories and there are so many prophetic words and a lot of people that are purporting to speak on behalf of God, you can easily get yourself into trouble if you are not careful. And then conclusion number two, that the word of God is the antidote for deception. An antidote is something that is used to treat something that is has a fatal implications when it gets into someone. So the word of God is the antidote for deception. And so what we need is to have a deep knowledge and understanding of God's word. Let us not be poor as far as God's word is concerned. And then number three, conclusion, we said that the prophetic and the spectacular are not always godly. When you find something that is prophetic, and spectacular, it is not necessarily godly because even Jesus said that many, many false prophets in the last days will come and even perform mighty signs and wonders, but they will be aiming at deceiving, if possible, even 
the elect. And so because of that, we need to exercise discernment. There is something about discernment. When you walk with the Spirit of God and you are fully loaded with God's Word, there's a way the Spirit of God and the Word of God work to help you sense if something is actually ungodly. Now, I want us to go to the next uh, portion of what we have been teaching, understanding deception, and this is part two of the series. And I would like to take you to First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. And um, this is the Apostle Paul writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. And Timothy is being, you know, cautioned about what the Apostle Paul was calling the great apostasy. And it's amazing that in the first century, the Apostle Paul would write things that would be real, that we see them in reality today. And so read with me, and then we'll go back up and begin to pick up part two of this and see what, what is this all about. And he writes, begins by saying, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And verse 4 says, For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And goes on to say, verse 5, for it is sanctified. Now, um, when you look at this um, teaching, you begin to realize there are many things that the Apostle Paul actually uh, talked about and we see them today. And again, we begin by saying that human beings are tragically susceptible to deception. That is something I don't want you to forget, that it is tragic that sometimes what is obviously deceptive doesn't always look so for so many people. We can walk right into deception when we are thinking, actually, we are doing the right thing. And we have already seen that the Latin root word for the word deception, it means to be ensnared, to be seized, or taken away or carried away by error. You know, there is a seizure of some sort when you are deceived and you are taken away because of error. And we saw that the Greek word for deception means to go astray, to wander off course, to deviate from the path, uh, from the correct path, or to roam into error or to be misled. All these words, when you combine the Latin understanding with the Greek understanding, then you find that they are bringing the same unified understanding of what deception really is. And we saw that when you talk about error, error is a state of or condition of being wrong in conduct of judgment, and it leads to deception. When we live in error for a long time, then it leads to deception if the error is not corrected on time, and then a lot of other people begin to join in and becomes a mass sort of a situation where you have so many people that have gotten into deceptions. Now, today I want us to go deeper and look at the characteristics of deception. It is very important when you are trying to understand something or a subject to appreciate its characteristics because characteristics basically are certain features, attributes, or qualities that identify something, and in this case, deception. So when we begin to look at the features or rather the characteristics of deception, we are trying to look at certain features or attributes that are also qualities that identify deception so that when you know them, then you, it's easy for you to be able to identify deception at its earlier stages and you avoid walking into that kind of deception. Now, it is very difficult to identify deception if you do not know its characteristics. And maybe this explains why many people innocently walk right into the trap of deception because possibly they have never taken time either to understand or to be taught when it comes to the attributes or features or qualities or basically the characteristics of what entail deception. So the first characteristic, which is very important, and every Christian needs to bear uh, uh, to, to understand, is persuasive words. 
persuasive words. Now we know that persuasion is the ability to induce, make or convince someone to believe or do something through reasoning or argument. Persuasion is the ability, that capacity that people have or someone has to induce or make or convince someone else to believe or do something through reasoning and argument. And I'm sure many of us are either persuasive, there are some of us that are really gifted in that persuasion, like if you meet someone who is a, a marketer by profession, there are people who are just good in terms of talking and they can just talk you into something. And when you, when you meet, for example, a very good salesman, they are even said to be able to sell honey to the bees. You know, bees make honey, but if a salesman, you know, has honey, he can actually sell it back to the bees because of the power of the persuasiveness of their words. And so, when we are persuasive, we are able to induce or make or convince other people to believe or do something through reasoning or argument. And if you find people that have been deceived, chances are that they have allowed themselves to be in a place whereby they have given the persuader or the deceiver an opportunity to be able to use their words in a persuasive way. And so they end up being convinced either to believe or to do something because of that kind of reasoning or that kind of argument. And this is because the deceiver actually knows the power of persuasive words. Deceivers know that if they can be able to use their words effectively, then they can be able to persuade others. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 8, the Bible says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. You know, the writer to the church at Colossae was telling them that I want you to know that there is a way, if you are not careful, you'll be deceived by persuasive words. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men and according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So the writer to the church at Colossae was worried that unless he writes this letter to the church here, someone would come and use persuasive words so that they cheat them with the philosophy and empty deceit and the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world as opposed to to those ones according to Jesus Christ. I want you to know that even the apostle here understood the danger of the use of persuasion as far as deception is concerned. Persuasion disarms and overwhelms the intellectual aspect of the victim by casting doubts on the stunning truth. So when a deceiver comes with persuasion, the idea is to get you to move out of what you have always stood by because you already know what you know, but because of the use of persuasion and a strong argument, and especially philosophical arguments, then it is possible that if you are not properly grounded, you can easily be moved away and swayed away and deceived through the power of persuasion. And it is often done through great eloquence and mastery of speech. If you'll ever find people that are very eloquent and masters of speech, it is good to be very, very careful because such people can easily wow you. There is something about wonderful, great speakers and people with great voices and words and good English and good phrases and the way to phrase and frame words. It is very easy to fall prey and victim of such people because by the time you realize you have already been disarmed because when this person speaks, you just want to listen to them. You want to hear them. And it is because the power of persuasion relies on great eloquence and mastery of speech. And so, a uh, characteristic of deception number one is persuasive words. Beware when you find people who are persuasive uh, sometimes they could easily lead you astray using the power of uh, persuasive words. The second characteristic of Deception is subtlety. Subtlety and subtlety, the word is uh, spelled as S U B T L E T Y from the word subtle. Subtlety, of course, uh, B is silent. Now, subtlety is the quality of being silent, the quality of being unnoticeable, the quality of being concealed, covert, 
and without attracting attention. So when you say that, you know, subtlety is something that comes in a way that it is coming, but you really quite can't see it, you can't notice it because it is silent, it is concealed, it is unnoticeable, it is covered, it is without the capacity to attract attention to itself. And that's why the Apostle Paul, writing again to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, was, verse 1 to 3, he says, Oh, that you would bear with me, a little, with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Then he comes to what he wanted to say. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now I want you to realize that the Apostle Paul, you know, is addressing the issue of being deceived. You know, the church being deceived and being moved away actually from the way that he wants them to be as far as their being the bride of Christ is concerned because he understands that the deception comes in a way that unless you are alert, you will just be deceived. So subtlety is actually the principle too of the deceiver. Let me tell you something. If I wanted to deceive you, I wouldn't come and say, okay, listen, I want you to be now alert because I'm just about to deceive you. No one does that. Anyone who is aiming at deceiving other people never comes and, you know, a con man will never come and say, look, now I am just going to con you as you watch. I'm going to cheat you as you watch. I'm going to defraud you. You know, I'm going to build this huge, you know, pyramid scheme and take your money and before you know it, I'm a billionaire and I've disappeared. You know, if, if someone did that, obviously, you never trust them and you never fall for that. But what people do when they want to deceive you, they come with subtlety, this capacity to be completely unnoticeable, silent, concealed, covered, you know, without attracting attention and yet promising wonderful and great things that are empty. The serpent that the Apostle Paul is referring to used this tactic to deceive Eve at the garden. Let me tell you, the serpent never came and told Eve, Eve, listen, I know you are privileged, you are really blessed in this garden, and you know I'm so envious, but I want you to know that right now I'm going to deceive you, I'm going to lie to you, and I'm going to make sure you actually disobey God. You know, that's not what the serpent did. He actually came very subtly and used this tactic of deception and subtlety to deceive Eve at the Garden of Eden. And that is why when the Apostle Paul writes in verse 3, says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And that's why in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, now the serpent was more cunning. And that is the point. The cunningness is the one that makes saltity possible. That the, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall eat of every uh, tree of the garden? You see, saltity is used when the victim is likely to question the purported new truth or revelation. The reason the deceiver will be subtle because they know that if they come direct with the deception, then the victim is able to question. And so you use salty so that you disarm the victim from a, a questioning the purported new truth or revelation. And then what happens is catchy phrases are used to diminish God's words and appeal to people's carnality. If you look at much of the deception that takes place in the church of Jesus Christ, they are very interesting, catchy phrases, and you know, they are all over the place, just like the serpent did in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. He says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. That's a catchy phrase. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, you will, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God and knowing good and evil. So, you know, wonderful phrases, wonderful statements and catchy phrases. And of course, we know that when you think about deception, generally today you hear people just tell you, you know, scriptures don't really mean that. 
you know, people, you know, twist scripture and they tell you the word of God doesn't really mean that. And then God wants you to be happy. That is a statement that has been used by many, many deceivers, even in the church. Or others have just told us you are too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. When people want to deceive us and, you know, remove our mind from the eternal perspective of the calling of God, they will tell us you are too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. And, you know, people feel guilty and they know love at that. You know, I've heard people say that if you are poor, you cannot be a friend of God. Those are wonderful phrases, wonderful statements. And, you know, you know, many, many crazy things that people say. And yet all those are subtle uh, attempts to actually deceive the people of God. So I want you to know that we are discussing the characteristics of deception. We have already seen that characteristic number one of deception are persuasive words. And number two is subtlety, that ability or that quality of being silent, unnoticeable, concealed, covert, and without attracting attention at all. And then number three, characteristic number three, is smooth words and flattery. Smooth words and flattery. There are people that are just gifted when they speak, you know, the words are so smooth, they are so nice, and they really appeal to you because they are coined at ensuring that they make you feel good, especially when you are being taken advantage of. If you have ever met a con man, con men are sweet talkers. They really know how to talk you into disarming you from realizing that they are actually cheating you. So smooth words and flattery is the act of praising or enticing someone often in a way that is not sincere because you want something from them. The difference between no more affirming words and statement and smooth words and flattery is that when somebody praises you and entices you, they are doing it in an insincere manner. They are not meaning what they are saying. The reason they are saying what they are saying to you is not so that because they just want you to know that they appreciate you and they like who you are. They are doing it because they want to disarm you and earn your trust so that when they start eating you up, you have no idea that is what is happening. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, the Bible says, Now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ by their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the simple. And we know so many people that have really been deceived by smooth words of flattering speech, you know, by people who are actually causing divisions, they are actually causing offenses, and they do not serve the Lord, but they serve their own bellies. We have been treated to all these kind of charlatans, people who really know how to speak, they know how to use or misuse the word of God. They know how to praise you. They come to, they tell you, you know, we appreciate you, we honor you, and we, we value you, you are the best of the Lord, you are the apple of God's eye, and they tell you all sorts of things that we know without you we couldn't be, and they saw so many wonderful, I mean, they say so so many wonderful things, but in actual sense, what they are doing is they simply are using smooth words, flattering speech, because they want to deceive the hearts of the simple people. And this is because the deceiver usually will pretend to love and show concern of the deceived. If you have looked at cults, for example, cults are very good in terms of showing love and concern. And many people that want to deceive others, they will look for an opportunity like now when everything is down and people are discouraged, people are needy, people have no money, people have no food, and some people move in now with great effort to you know, meet needs and really show you that they love, they care, and surround you, and literally, literally smother you with what looks like love. But actually, the idea is not to show the love of God. The idea is to use that to control you and win you so that at some point, they put you in their pockets and begin to control you because the deceiver will usually employ for sincerity and humility, but this is full of malice and deceit. Some of you have been treated to this kind of thing where you find some people come to you, 
and they begin to show you a lot of kindness. They show you that they are very close. They care so much. And, you know, they, you know, they begin to walk with you. But somewhere down the line, you begin to notice they are controlling you. They don't allow you to think of for yourself. They don't want you to interact with other people. And sometimes even churches that become cultic and heavy controlling, that's what they do. You know, they show you a lot of love. They are visiting you. They are providing for you. And sooner or later, they begin to tell you that don't fellowship with other people. Don't talk to other church members and don't be part of certain groups of people. And before you know it, you are sucked into a cultic situation that you don't even know how you got there. So those are the three different ways in which you can identify the characteristics of uh, deception. Now, how do you counter deception? So after saying all that, how do we counter deception? So I want to give you some points on how you deal with deception. The first thing that you must do is that you must verify what you are being told. It doesn't matter who is saying it. We have a problem many times when people especially come in the name of the Lord and in the name of the Bible. You must always be able to verify what you are being told because nothing is unverifiable. If you are if you are just careful enough and diligent enough, it is possible to verify virtually anything from whoever is talking irrespective of who they are. In other words, you must be able to cross-check information against the Bible. The word of God is a plumb line for every kind of truth that anyone would want to bring to us. And this, I bring you to uh, at the attention of some wonderful believers that actually distinguish themselves as people who would not just take anything irrespective of which apostle brought it to them. Acts chapter 17, verse 10 to 11, the Bible says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, and these were more fair-minded than those in the Salonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. What basically these Christians in Berea were doing, they were simply verifying what they were being told because they did not want anyone to deceive them. It doesn't matter who comes. An angel will come. An apostle will come. A great Bible teacher will come. But I want you to know that at whatever point it is, you must be able to verify what you are being told. Please be you know, clear and be bold enough to be able to still receive the word with readiness, but then be prepared to verify what you're being told. People who are not able to verify what they are being told are sitting ducks of deception because they never verify what they are being told. They swallow, hook, float, and sinker, uh, like they say in the fishing world. Number two, beware of new or fresh revelation. This is especially very dangerous because many people want a fresh word. You know, these people want something fresh. And, and I understand because, I mean, this is the same Bible we read. It's the same word you've read probably these chapters, you know, over and over. And there doesn't seem to be anything new. But I want you to know that every time you begin to hunt for new and fresh revelation, you know, people really come with exciting revelations and they're telling you, you never heard this. I want you to be very careful because that is a point when you are very most likely to be deceived. Beware of people who casually dismiss everything you have always known. You know, I've sat in places and someone stands up and, you know, eloquent and very, you know, well-read and well-studied and they say, I want, before I start to speak to you, I want you to forget everything you have ever heard about this subject. And I'm wondering, hmm, that is scary. You know, you cannot tell someone who has been taught and brought up in scripture all their life to forget everything that they have heard and it's because you are about to bring them a new or a fresh revelation. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9 to 10, the Bible says something very, very interesting. It says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new 
under the sun. Some of the things you see today, some of the deceptions you see today, even with some of us ministers of the gospel, really taking people for a ride, lying to them and teaching them, these are not things that began yesterday. You just need to read church history and you discover that we are simply repeating what many other people came and did long, long before us. Heresies have been there and they just keep on, you know, taking different shades, but the principle is the same. It is all deception. So the, the, the wisdom of Ecclesiastes says that that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. Beware when somebody comes and tells you this one you've never heard. This one is new. This one has just come from the throne of grace. Jesus just spoke to me last night. He appeared to me in my sleep. You know, when people talk like that, my friend, start being very, very careful because you are being set up for deception. In Acts chapter 17, verse 16 to 17 and verse 21, this is the Apostle Paul and, you know, he was waiting at Athens. The Bible says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spend their times, listen to this, in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. <laughs> the Apostle Paul went to a city where people are open for new revelations. But the Bible says he was so grieved because he realized that because of this openness to newness, the city was given to idols because there were so many new idols being introduced because of the openness of the city for that. And that's why you need to avoid the temptation of wanting to, need to hear new things. My friend, let me tell you, there aren't many, many new things that you need to hear. The only one old thing that you must keep hearing is the same, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of all glory. That truth will never change change it will never be new even if somebody packages it with sugar and honey and whatever else it will never ever sound any different because that is all what you need to hear and whatever else that is written plainly in scripture without being twisted or being spiced to sound anything better avoid the temptation of wanting to hear new things because in Acts chapter 17 verse 22 and 23, the Bible says, then Paul stood. This is after, you know, he sees that everybody is waiting either to tell or to hear something new. So because he took advantage of that opportunity, he says, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You know, the apostle Paul saw that there had been a loophole because people were always waiting either to tell to hear something new. Somebody came and told them that there is a new God who is unknown and they also received that out of deception. But the apostle Paul, because he was inspired of the spirit, he took advantage of that loophole and introduced the known God because you cannot worship what you do not know. And then number three, number three, how to deal with deception is you need to design motives. You need to design motives. When you begin to interact with people, please design their motive. People always have a motive of doing something. Beware of unusual kindness and love. When people begin to show you very unusual kindness and love, and especially in matters related to religion and affiliation to certain movements and groups, you need to be very, very careful because love can be with a lot of hypocrisy. And that's why in Romans 12, verse 9 to 10, the author admonishes believers and tells them that let love be without hypocrisy because it is possible to pretend to love, but your love is full of hypocrisy. It is not genuine. It is not intended for good, it is intended for evil, it is intended to cause confusion and to trap people into something that is ungodly. So, you know, let love be without hypocrisy, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love 
in honor giving preference to one another. When you begin to look at love, love must be, you know, true love is pure and it is godly according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 to 6. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts for neither at any time did we use flattering words as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Jesus Christ. So the apostle Paul here was trying to show that, you know, it is possible to go to people, but go to them with brotherly and pure love. Love that is God, the love that is not intended to shroud yourself in mystery and just smother people with love so that you can disarm them and take advantage of them. We have seen situations where people are done like that. They are smothered with love. They are surrounded with fellowship. You know, they are visited. They are called, you know, every day. And, you know, just to be, you know, shown that we love you. But the intention is not actually to love. The intention is to begin to disarm the person so that whatever the deceiver is looking for, they can begin to get it. So please design motives. When you find people that are beginning to offer you things that you didn't even ask, things you don't need, and even company that you haven't asked, they are almost becoming an irritation because they don't give you even space to breathe. Sometimes this is how cults behave. They smother you they make you feel like you're loved. They even tell you that, you know, the church you used to go to, we know they never did this to you. And so we want to show you true love. But eventually they capture you and completely overwhelm you. And before you know it, you're being taught things that are actually completely outside scripture. And then number four, dealing with deception, avoid deceivers. Avoid deceivers. I know some of us are brave and we feel like we can manage anything. But please, if you don't have to be in the way of deceivers, just stay away from deceivers. Romans chapter 12, verse 16 to 17. Now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. I want you to notice the Apostle Paul did not write and tell the church in Rome that guys, you know, go confront them, sit in their midst and argue with them and just say, you know, pulverize them and silence them. You know, he didn't say that. He says, now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ by their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the simple. May God help us that we can come to a place whereby we are not, you know, very easily, you know, attracted to these things. I tell you, there's so much deception. There are a lot of videos that are available on YouTube and on Facebook, and there are so many deceivers. There are people showing great things and, you know, eloquently, you know, uh, well-designed things. You know, they can show you evidence. They can show you fruit of what they are doing. But I want you to be careful because the more you begin to delve into that, the easier you become a snare. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that, you know, you need to avoid this kind of things. Friends, deception is real. There are so many people that have been hurt by deception. There are so many people's lives who have been derailed because they were deceived. I have seen families destroyed because they succumbed to deception. I have seen mothers, wonderful mothers, educated, completely reduced to hopeless people because they got in the crutches of deceivers who are misusing them for their own ends. I have seen churches destroyed by deceivers. People got in and purported to be hearing from God and, you know, being able to hear from the Lord and, you know, provide answers and solutions to problems. And before you knew it, people found themselves deeply entrenched into very deceptive ways of life. You know people have been deceived in the world of money. They were cheated that this is a beautiful investment opportunity. Uh, please invest and, you know, we're going to pay you four times what banks are able to give you. And before you know it, because it appeals to our carnality, our desires, and human flesh, we all get trapped and go there. And worse is when we are deceived out of the simplicity of the love that we have in Christ. I pray that all of us will be careful that we do not get trapped into these things because we can deal with 
Decep we can counter deception by verifying what we are being told. Do not be ashamed. When people come to you, they purport to be telling you something. Please go to scripture. And if you are not able, find someone you know who is able to understand scripture. Many of you are pastors who are well taught of the word. If you are not sure about something you heard from somewhere, please bounce it off to your pastor. And especially if you know that your pastor is someone who understands and teaches scripture as it is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Then beware of new or fresh revelation. This is a serious catch. We love new things. We love fresh revelation. If you find movements that are really catching up to people, they come with a new revelation. You know, they have this thing that nobody else does. You know, you, know, you, you want to be part of this. This is the new way. This is what the Lord is saying in the 21st century. And we all moved and swept in that direction. And before you know it, we are being told that you cannot um, have a relationship with your wife. You have to repent before you, you do this. You have, you know, to repent every time you stand up. And, you know, all this kind of nonsense. And people get so easily deceived. And then you need to design motives. Don't just trust everybody that purports to take care of you and to meet your needs. Most people will be doing this on the short term because they want to catch you. They want actually to ensure that they trap you and then teach you certain creed where you are tied to an extent that if you, even if you want to leave, you are threatened with dire consequences. And we know people that have joined such movements. It was very easy to join. It was very exciting. But you go to a point whereby you realize you can't leave because you are told that the day you leave, then your things will go southwards. And because of that, you live in fear and deception. And then most importantly, please avoid deceivers. Not everything that's on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram is good for you. Beware of what you watch, beware of what you read, because you could easily get yourself into trouble. Because all the devil needs is a small space in your heart. And before you know it, he has captured you. And he's taken you captive. So I believe that you've gotten something to do to help you so that you can be able to follow. And I'm sure on our screen we have been enlisting all these points. And if you have been writing, please write them, review them. And also if you can help someone who you know has been trapped because it is possible for us to free other people from deception. Because deception is an enemy of God's people and the devil uses it every now and then to destroy God's people and I pray that we are safe and even during this season when we have so much time that we will not fall into deception because our God is looking after us. So thank you so much for listening to this word. I would like to pray with anyone right now who feels really like they've been through a situation uh, possibly you're just watching us from somewhere and as I was teaching this you realize that you've actually fallen into deception. I, I would like to pray with you and so that your heart is free and then you begin to gravitate back towards the simplicity that is in Christ so that you're not deceived like Eve was deceived by the serpent. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that has watched and followed this teaching today. Lord, we realize that deception is real and so many people have been railed from your plans because of following deceptive ways of the enemy. Right now, Father, I pray for freedom for everyone that has been taken captive by a deceptive spirit in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that you rescue any family right now that is grappling with the issues of deception and that they have lost so much track of where they were previously. I pray for restoration in Jesus' name. And Father, most importantly, I pray that this word will be an antidote against future deception by whatever means, O oh Lord, and from whatever source, I give you praise and I give you glory. Before I close this uh, moment of the word, the word deception is deception outside Christ. When you are cheated that you are well and you're okay that you don't need the Lord. There are so many people that have been deceived. They are walking in sin. They are living and walking dead. They don't know Jesus and yet they feel that they are okay. I want you to know that's a worse deception. And the best way to break free from this is to allow Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life. And I'll take this opportunity again to pray with anyone who is in that kind of situation. Would you kindly uh, pray this short and simple prayer after me? Say, Lord Jesus, today I realize 
that have been living in deception. And right now, I turn around. I open my heart and I invite Jesus to come into my heart. Jesus, I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. Right now, I accept you and receive you as my Lord and Savior. And Satan, I reject you. I renounce you together with your works. And I turn away from you. I belong to Jesus from now, henceforth. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I pray this, and I believe it, and I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have prayed that prayer, please let us know, and let us see how we can be of help to you, because we need to follow up and just make sure that you join a Bible-believing church and Bible-believing group of people that can help you to walk together in this journey of faith to the glory of God. So God bless you. Appreciate you and thank you for receiving this word. Next time when I stand here, God willing, I'll be looking at uh, Understanding Deception Part 3. So don't miss. Ensure that you are there on time next Sunday, same time like today, and we shall be able to be together. God bless you. Love you. And I appreciate you.